So I'm going to talk a bit about the experiences uh, of the Google IPv6 internal software porting effort, uh, which I've been part of for the last two years or so, more or less not enough. So to give a bit of overview, uh, Google has a pretty large code base. It's not humongous by any standards, but it's pretty large. Uh, tens of millions of lines of code in C++. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about C++ because that's where the interesting parts lie for us. Uh, for others, this will obviously be different. Uh, when I say when I say Google's code base, we actually mostly have one single tree, uh, and and this has advantages and disadvantages. It's great because you can fix things once instead of a hundred times. It's not so great when you break something central and you have a couple thousand engineers that are mad at you. At that point, it's it's good being in Zurich. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this does not count a few a few external things, like Android is not part of this, Chrome is not part of it, but you can get sort of the idea. Uh, this is a bottom-up effort. It's not like management that comes up from, from, from below. Sorry, it's not management that comes down from above and says, do IPv6. This is something people started doing by themselves because they thought it was a good idea. So at that point, you want to prioritize. You want to take the most important part first. And the most important part is definitely the one that shows, hey, we can do this. So let's look at the, the obvious differences. I mean, uh, I'm sure most people know this, uh, but for others, uh, it's not as obvious. IPv4 and IPv6 are really much the same thing. I don't know who first said no magic, just 96 bar bits. Uh, I think I picked it up from, from some presentation here a couple of years ago. But it's definitely true. There are all these sorts of, of minor differences, uh, like flow labels. If anyone can tell me what a flow label is good for, please tell me. Uh, but, but mostly, you, you don't really have to care about them. The single biggest difference, at least when you're writing something server-side, is that the addresses happen to be larger. And if you can fix that, you're like 95% down the way. There are a few exceptions from that, uh, which we'll be talking about near the end. But in general, if you can make your application understand that an address is more than 32 bits, you're good. So let's look at the different ways uh, of representing addresses in your space. Uh, these are, are a few things you should avoid. Uh, I've seen, I mean, one thing is obvious, like SOC adder in, which is an IPv4 address, in adder, which is an IPv4 address with no port. Int is, is unfortunately very common. Uh, inside Google, I've seen, seen lots of hideous variations on these, uh, like type depths to these, like structs containing them, like people using 64-bit int. I don't think I've seen anyone represent an IP address in a floating point number yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. Java. <laughs> Java, actually, OK, thank you. Uh, and, and worse still, uh, you cannot grep for an int. So it's really hard to know sort of when you have tens of millions of lines of code, where is sort of the devil. But, but let's, let's look at a few strategies anyway. Uh, the one, first one is the obvious one. If you're writing things from scratch, you can pretend that IPv4 and IPv6 is the same thing. Uh, and this is basically what your operating system probably already does. If you open an IPv6 socket and set it as dual stack, and people connect to it over IPv4, you will get this special kind of IPv4 mapped into the v6 space, which is good because we have lots and lots and lots of v6 space, so we can put all the v4 space within it somewhere. This gives you these weird-looking FFFF addresses, uh, which you might, when you're displaying them, show as something else. But in general, you can just pretend that, well, it's all IPv6, it's fine and dandy, and we can go from there. The problem is, is, of course, if you don't have IPv6 on the machine, if you're writing client software, this doesn't work. And the other really much bigger problem is if you have an interface with code that is not ready, this, this doesn't work, right? If I have a sock adder in 6, I cannot pass this off to a function that has, just takes in sock adder in. Yes, question? Okay, the question is, if you store it as an, as an IPv6 address, you don't have a little big endian problem. I can tell you, you actually have little big endian problems anyway, but they're much more obvious. So, so uh, yes, you're right. Uh, so, so the big problem here, it's, it's a viable strategy, but it requires you to take everything at once. And as we already see, I mean, I, I cannot go and fix, fix a big program in one night. It's, it's just impossible. So the other part, which is probably uh, what most people is gonna be doing, is, is building some sort of address abstraction. Now, obviously, this depends, again, on what language am I using. I'm talking about C++ here. Uh, for people using, for instance, Python or PHP, this is going to be 
probably a different game. Uh, but an address abstraction is simply some sort of object that represents an IP address. It may be an IPv4 address, it may be an IPv6 address, but mostly you can sort of deal with them the same thing. They have the same kinds of operations. For instance, I can get the port. Both have a port. I can perhaps match against them. I can see does this list, does this address match this list of addresses? Uh, so depending on language, there are different, different things. Unfortunately, C has the problem that we don't have a good address abstraction. We do have sock adder in storage, which is huge, takes up like 256 bytes of memory. Uh, there is, but there's nothing that actually has is an IPv6 or IPv4 address without a port. Uh, people will often use strings. This is actually not as bad as it might sound. Um, Java typically does this. Uh, it's not too uncommon in, say, PHP. Uh, if, at least if you're in a dynamically typed language, this is, this is just fine. Uh, we, we made our own classes, uh, IP address, which is an IPv4 or an IPv6 address, socket address, which is the same thing in a port, and IP range, which we would have called IP subnet if that name weren't taken. Actually, the name IP address were taken, so we moved like 4,000 entries of that over to old IP address and made our new class. <laughs> the, these, these types are not magic. They are not hard to make. They are pretty much obvious. Uh, you can look at squid, for instance, has something that looked like if I didn't know better, I think they just like stole our code. Uh, but but you must must sort of decide to what level do you want things to be abstracted. For instance, we got kicked back at some point because we didn't support Unix domain sockets. You might, if you if you are adventurous, you might want to pull DNS into this. I wouldn't recommend sort of mixing a host name and an IP address. Java tried to do that. It it's it has pro problems. So sort of decide. What do I want to abstract away? What do I want to do? And what do I not want to do? And build something simple. This will usually serve you pretty well. So when we've been doing this for a while, uh, like a couple of months, we saw that most code actually does not need to care about what an address is. You get an address object from somewhere. You pass it around. You might store it somewhere. You might ask some function to do it in a string. But you don't actually need to care what it is. The structure of an IP address is, unless, of course, you're writing a router which I'm not doing, thankfully. Uh, you don't need to care about what it is. You can just like send them on. And that leads us to the strategy of IPv6 address coercion, which basically, in our case, there are many ways of doing this, but we take the first 64 bits of an address, hash it, and squeeze it into unused IPv4 space. That's, that's what, what do you say? That's used. Yeah, well, okay, so the question is, that's used. And yes, that is multicast space. But you can also take like a new class eSpace. Right, and and if you if you uh, really want to care, you can use local host space, for instance. So yes, it's it's an ugly and hideous hack, but it actually works really well. So so this has been used all over the place, and and the okay, thanks. The the, the good thing is it allows you to take all your IPv4 code and send them IPv4 addresses. You can of course there are some things you cannot do. You cannot geolocate them. You cannot use them in ACLs. There is some risk of collision, but of course there is risk of collision in NATs anyway. And, and we, we coerce all the time. I mean, the very, very first Google over IPv6 implementation was a reverse proxy setting the address to 255.666. And, and of course, we've been moving on to there. Uh, most of our software now understands, understands IPv6 addresses, but you can still actually, I mean, you really need to be a bit careful. Like, uh, at some point, these leak to the users. So Gmail would say your last login address was 23955, whatever. So that's obviously not good. But you can do it everywhere. And we even do it uh, automatically in production. If at some point you try to convert an IPv6 address to an IPv4 address instead of crashing within a search failure, we actually just convert it. And log a warning and column gets paged. I don't think this actually happened yet in production, but it's good to be sure. So the obvious battle plan. Uh, this mostly, uh, there's, there's uh, a few problems left, right? There's multi-homing, which is not an IPv6 problem, but now almost everyone will have an IPv4 and IPv6 address anyway, so you'll need to deal with this. This is not the simple case, right? The other case is that the address space is a lot larger. This means that your typical spammer will have lots of address space. Uh, your typical DOS attacker will have lots of address space. It means you can no longer store one bit per slash 24. So you'll need some sort of, of structure that doesn't deal with, doesn't try to slice up the IPv4 space into fixed sizes anymore. 
So you, you will need to do some work here. I'm saying generally this IPv6 porting is easy, but it's not trivial. And, and especially multi-homing and security are going to be your, your difficult parts. So the obvious way of doing it, uh, test it. Start sending IPv6 traffic to your service, watch it break. And when that gets fixed, you try it and try it again until you're happy. Uh, if you are using a statically typed language like we're doing, you can simply go out and grep for the types. Grep for in adder, oh, well, you can't grep for int, but you can't grep, can perhaps grep for old IP address or whatever. Uh, we've been doing experiments with, with static analysis, which actually looks like if your function is dealing with an IPv4 specific type and not dealing with an IPv6 specific type, perhaps this should be a warning. If your function is calling another IPv4 unsafe function, perhaps that is also bad, but in general, low tech works. So, so simply just start in one end, start in the obvious end so your user can get your code ace, and, and then you can get a cake, and then you can go sort of go back and, and fix the back ends afterwards. Questions? Um, you listed three three uh, struts that were kind of uh, m messing up stuff, and, and uh, I say that it was in the previous speaker here talking about Jabber on, on Windows. That's the reason. Yeah, I, I don't actually know how this works in the in the Windows world, right? They have BSD API and then some sort of parallel API. Uh, so I don't know how this looks, but in general, I mean, convert in Android in Android six, and you will be mostly fine. So, so as a fellow programmer, what I struggle with with IPv6 is CLI formatting, because um, you don't have 17. A 17 width field is usually good for IPv4 address. So, I mean, you guys have all this cool GUI stuff that can compress addresses, but how do you deal with that when you need to put do printups and that sort of stuff? Well, how thankfully, how do you make it look pretty? Thankfully, we don't. Right, like most users don't use use width anymore. Uh, I would, I mean. I cannot help you compress 128 by bits down to like 15 characters, unless of course you do the hashing and coercing, but I don't think your admin will be happy about that. Right, yeah, what, what we tend to do in, when we need to have summarized tables is that we put high order two bytes, dot, 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 low order two bytes, and try to fit it in 17 so we could have V4 and V6 man, manipulated. And you, and you know, the higher order bits aren't always that useful unless you're looking at prefixes, and the lower order ones are kind of MAC address opaque-ish. Yeah, and this depends a lot on who you are, right? We care, I mean, we don't even care about lower 64 bits. Right. Uh, and the admin will probably only care about lower 64 bits, so you have to sort of know your audience. But please allow me to make it wider, because my screen is widescreen, and I'd rather have that than, than other ways of showing it. I, ha I have a more basic question. Um, I didn't understand the trick of the uh, hashing, so could you go back to the slide and <laughs> can I see that? This part? Yeah. So this this hash could be anything, by the way. You might want to to actually do encryption or whatever in case you're worried that an attacker might be controlling your bits. So what what's the purpose of this hashing? What what what, what are you doing with this? What I'm doing with the address, I'm taking the IPv6 address. Uh -huh. I'm picking out the first 64 bits, uh -huh. which because the lower 64 bits are for me, they are noise anyway. And I'm hashing them down and putting them into an IPv4 address. So whenever I now need to give this IPv6 address to some piece of code or some log or whatever that doesn't understand v6, I will give them this identifier instead. Now this address doesn't mean anything. So main one one major application of this is logging that only understands IPv4, for example. Is that no, correct? No, no, no. Uh, can you please repeat? Okay. Oh, oh sure. Well, you cannot use this to route on. You definitely cannot use this to route on at all. This is just some sort of identifier that I'm giving to my application software. Yeah, or, but since this is hashing, it's it's it, it, it's many to one mapping, right? Sure, it's definitely so, many to one mapping, and you will get collisions. Ah. Uh, of course, you could, in theory, make record all the collisions you're making and make a reverse table, like start at two ten four zero zero one two three four five. Okay. That okay. might be viable. I've actually seen software which does this. Let, let me let me give you an example. For example, if you're running a telecommunications company and every time you make a phone call or a data connection and it logs that connection as what's known as a call detail record, you will get a a thirty nine character IPv six string. If your billing system is very expensive 
and difficult to upgrade, this is a good solution. You, you have a program that doesn't understand IPv6. <laughs> you want to use it anyway. You have millions of lines of code that doesn't understand IPv6. You want to use them anyway. You have a tiny percentage of your users that's coming in over v6. Give it a v4 address. That's what it wants. And then you can fix it on its own time. That, that's the purpose of this. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's definitely a temporary measure, right? You don't want to have these lying around in 10 years. So, so you plan doing it on the Gmail uh, log, which you have your sessions on, because it says undefined if you've been using it. Yes. Would you like that, or would you like no Gmail? Uh, I like it's kind of undefined. It's like more secret. And, uh, no, it says <laughs> cool. that, yeah. Right. Well, well, so the reason it now says undefined is that previously we would say 224 or whatever, blah, blah, blah. 238, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not sure if everyone was present when I announced this preliminary analysis results yesterday. But um, in terms of subnet branching, the IPv6 addresses have uh, two regions between bytes, uh, bits uh, 12 and 48 and bits 64 and 80, which makes uh, 52 bits together. Yeah, so this is where essentially information is in the IPv6 address. Okay, it's good to know. So you might want to be more selective. This is sort of the quick and dirty solution. All right. Last comment. Has anyone considered static code analysis? If you have millions of lines of code, yes, could this something is... like a Verity could find out that this is ever this came out of a socket or mind the connect or is going to be used in there, you should be able to find it then. Like, like, I, like I said, we did this with the Hydra, which is a GCC plugin. You can probably also do it with Clang. And yes, it gives you good results, but grep is, is for our purposes actually good enough. I mean, you can be really high tech. If you use int, of course, or u32, as I have been known. To sure, use and, and, and then you go and sort of beat the developer. <laughs> so, so it doesn't do that again, and then you add a unit test, and you probably just like copy your IP for unit test, it doesn't do it again. That sounds good to me. <laughs> Thank you, Steiner. Thanks. Thank you. Public service announcement, if you're on the V4 uh, only Wi-Fi, please get off it. Um, embarrassingly, we have run out of private V4 space. <laughs> I swear I'm not making this up. It happened today. DHCP no, is now failing months. across campus for the guest network. So please get off it. Leave those. Yeah. The V6 network is separate and has a separate pool. This is not by design, but it'll keep us safe for now. It, it drives IPv4 deployment. <laughs> so, hi. Uh, my name is Fredrik Kone. I work at Ericsson back in Sweden. Um, and I'm going to talk about what's up with um, applications in IPv6 in, in cellular networks, so some do's and don'ts considerations. So, um, but first, some 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 um, uh, corporate uh, PR uh, quickly. So, if if um, Carlsberg did Mobile Packet Core, they would probably claim it to be the best packet core in the world. So we do. And, of course, we can claim probably the best mobile packet core in the world. So that's uh, that's the part. Okay, let's move on. Um, is there a mic or do I have to stand here? Okay. Good, because I, I can meet it. So um, we've seen some some uh, some uh, cellular network uh, explanations how it's actually done. I think we need to go down to the the seven year old way because to understand this stuff really is good. So this is really what we are doing. We are kind of um, packing stuff on top of other stuff, uh, IP on on, on IP, and uh, we are doing encapsulation. So just to make it a bit more clear. Um, I brought my, since I don't have a baby here, I, I went to Walmart. So, so this is the, 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 uh, let's have a look here. Oh, it's a V6 packet, I could tell. <laughs> so it's like, if, if the gateway here is here, this is where you enter the mobile network. So this is uh, uh, internet, and that's the mobile packet core. And over there, there's the uh, the, the cellular, uh, the, uh, the radio there, and, and that'll be the, the terminal. So the packet comes in here, 
And then the, the gateway encapsulates it like this. And then, okay, where am, I, where am I to go? And then there are several nodes here that you could ask for where, where was this at last time. So, okay, it's over at that cell station. So it's getting transported through the network here. So this is actually encapsulation. And this is very important to understand that we already do tunneling in, in mobile networks. So, and then there's the radio here. So then you just go over the air. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Packet drop. <laughs> Resend, please. Resend, please. Okay. So, another new packet. Uh, go to this same station here, and hopefully I'll catch it this time. So, now it's going over the radio. So, now it's leaving the encapsulation, going on by a dome. And then the terminal takes it. And that's it. This is what we do. So, did you understand this one? Or do you want the 3DPP specs again? I don't think so. So, uh, some considerations when, when working in this environment. So, let's look at the buzzword IP agnostic. Um, I would like you to understand that IP agnostic is, is not being IP version arrogant, neither IP version ignorant. So, um, this is a bit of a problem. I'll, I'll continue and explain why. So, damn those keep lives. Um, I used to be using my my um, push email on my phone for, for Ericsson. We had a very expensive piece of software that you only could load on Sony Ericsson, but it killed my battery all the time because of the keep lives. So, what about IPv6? So, haven't you heard NATs are gone, or or are they? I got confused by all the discussions here, but still there are some maybe some firewalls with stateful and stuff like that, so you might need it. But let's let's consider that they are gone. So we're not in NAT44 land anymore. So why why don't we want keep lives? So if a cellular network, uh, an application there sends keep lives, and there could be plenty of applications or, that are actually uh, online. Then, then uh, what happens? This looks simple. Okay, there's the packet going over there. But what happens in the network? This happens, and this is on a good day. This is when the, the mobile is not moved. It's at the same station as we see saw here. And uh, you see the packet. It's actually in, in the blue part here. That's where we send the packet. But you have a, a lot of conversation over the radio before that. And then after a while, you do this. So. A lot of signaling just for one stupid keep alive that doesn't you need to have to send for IPv6. So if a packet core nodes could talk, they would probably say, Are you happy now? You're on an end-to-end -end connection, dumbass. Stop it. <laughs> well, unfortunately you cannot kind of communicate on that level, but so if you want to speak, uh, speak wisely. Um, and uh, we're talking about IPv6 being gold. And, and silence is golden, so let's try to be quiet if we don't have anything useful to say. So next consideration, uh, to be able to have connectivity in mobile set networks, you have to be able to provision for it. So um, i try to do a little demo here, just to prove my point. Okay, this is Android 2.1 uh, running IPv6 over cellular. So if I go into the to the settings here, oh, there it is, and I go to uh, wireless networks and mobile networks and access point names. Uh, I had to put the six in front of the APM because there's no way of of uh, actually saying that I want IPv6 or IPv4, and, and it's been in the standard since 97, so it's nothing new. Okay, um, let's go out of that, just to prove that it's actually working. Um, let's, and that, that it's actually a phone, what I'm using here. This is Google, and it, it shows the mobile pages, so it's actually an Android phone here. And uh, we, can do, we can do the IPv6 test wherever the, the screen is, there, there it is, to uh, watch the, uh, how it goes with the, uh, um, oh, that was Google again. I missed it, but 
there's the, the, the banner of the day. So I think we're, we're kind of done with that. Last, just to prove which network and make Cameron happy, I fire away the tricorder. And uh, look, no Wi-Fi, only cellular, and it's on T-Mobile. So it's working. Okay, I can do that since the demo is over. So wouldn't it be cool to have a phone like this to... to... <laughs> well, I put it on the coffee table, but there were no ladies coming forward to me because I had this uh, phone, so it's not a babe magnet. I'm sorry. But like uh, Picard says, make it so. Let's make all the other Google phones use IPv6 or cellular. So uh, provisioning, two minutes left, okay. Provisioning, I will do this. Um, of course, you will be able to, uh, you, you can't have these kind of boxes. Um, it, that is not IPv6, even if you hash it. So we can't do those. And uh, we have packets in packets. So if you like do something like the dual stack light, you have more packets in packets. So you don't want pack to pack more packets in the packets that's already packed in packets, right? Okay, so, and last, um, it's, it's a bit crowded in the IPv6 pool right now, but it's, it will go away because of the, of the efforts that we have been doing here, and it will soon be a bit more room there. And if you want to see some more videos of me doing IPv6 over cellular, there's the, the address. Okay, thank you. Crystal clear, thanks. I did a good job then. Sorry, I have a comment. Okay. Uh, my company is a user of Elixir product, so I, ha I have a lot of claim, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, as you said, push application it has very huge impact to the uh, concurrent usage of IP address. Before push application, number of uh, concurrent number of concurrent IP address uses is very few compared with the actual number. But now, now it is becoming uh, oh, sorry, sorry. But after push application, this number grows very rapidly. So it has very big impact. So uh, I totally agree with you that mobile application, mobile industry should also should move forward to IPv6. That it is my comment. Yeah, I agree. And not just for, for that reason, but for the two reasons that actually you could get more devices and you could get better battery lifetime. So that's it. Mr. IPv6 guy, thank you. So Probably I can deduct this from taxes since I've used it in, in work. <laughs> We're going to get set up for uh, a panel on uh, Randy's, <laughs> Randy's panel of presenters and you get some slides up. Can you help set up the chairs, please? Thanks. All on the same side, all on this side. Sir? All on this it's side. fine, do whatever you want to do. I'll direct your chairs. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <clears throat> maximum discovery. Watch the mic wires there. there. Exactly. Not in front of us, I think. Please put next to the Oh, oh that's right. <laughs> so all the uh, things are labeled the PNL panel? Down here. Tell people who have <clears throat> all the things that yeah. label PNL. Present down yeah, presentation. You can find the panel panel slides at the bottom. Um, we have only one mobile mic that's working, I think, at the moment, unfortunately. So you have the uh, station. It's okay. We're only got one guy who's doing mobility. <laughs> Do you want to introduce your uh, your panel? I was thinking of that. Yeah. Okay. That's a good idea. Hi, I'm Randy Bush. Hi, Jay. Um, we kind of put together a panel at the end to talk about 
Um, speed bumps. You know, if we, we, we have um, a number of different people from a number of different areas. Um, Thomas to talk about the ITF and Lorenzo to talk about uh, content providers and Ron to talk about large things at the other end of the pipe and Maz to talk about uh, backbone. I'm not going to talk about anything much. Um, um, I think Yari will be a good example of the Pollyanna, everything's wonderful. And if everything were one, was wonderful, why the hell are we having this meeting? Um, so no account for taste. Um, there's, um, 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 so there are real problems. We are engineers. Denying problems doesn't get them fixed. So um, we need to figure out what we can do to make um, um, it easy for the world to deploy IPv6 should they become motivated to do so. And uh, who'd like to go first? Thomas. Thanks for volunteering. You were holding the mic. I saw that. This is <laughs> go for it. All right. Thanks, Randy. Um, if you sent in slide, it's panel. Oh, my name is. Yeah, that, that's believable. And then I probably have to do a full screen somewhere. I don't know. That's this is IBM. Windows. Yikes. Let's get somebody from IBM to work on it. Uh, Windows, I think. Okay, I'm going to go through this fairly briefly because uh, some of this is kind of boring, I guess a little bit boring. But the general theme here is what, what work do we still need to do here on, on the IETF side to get V6 ready for deployment and, and make it more deployable? And the summary that I have is that, you know, at a high level, I think um, overall the main work has been done. You know, we, people keep running around saying we need to do more, what about this, what about this gap? But when um, you sort of look at it in more detail, it looks like the main, the major items that are out there on the table are being worked on now or are, you know, are either close to being done or are done. I'll go over some of those in, in, in detail. You know, but that said, there's always going to be work on V6, just like there's work on V4. Um, there's always more stuff to be done in terms of revising documents or as we actually deploy this stuff and run into real problems or real situations, we can presumably fix them and, and deal with them. You know, that said, there are still some loose ends that should definitely be dealt with um, one way or the other. And, and, and I'm, uh, you know, right before this panel, I had a conversation with Randy where he asked me, you know, well, what about the status of this? What about the status of that? And I'm like, well, I thought we had dealt with that or I thought that was an issue that we weren't going to move forward. And there's still, I guess, in some sense, lack of clarity about whether something needs to move forward and is a problem or whether we really um, have decided not to do something. And I think that would be good to, to do. So the main work areas are, you know, 6RD, there's, there's some work been done, there's some documents out or um, in the queue. Softwires, there's a fair amount of work, Behave, where all the, the NAT 6.4 kind of work is being done. There's some work in DHCP, 6MAN, V6 Ops, and so forth. Um, and I'll go through these pretty quickly, because I think we covered a lot of this, the 6RD work. There's a, a document that was published earlier that was sort of the informational. There's a standards track document in the queue that ha allocates also some DHCP code points. Um, so that's done in Behave. There's a, obviously a lot of work going on with the, the NAT 6.4, the DNS 6.4 work. Uh, the, the thing to note is that I think five documents went into ITF last call like two weeks ago. So now is a great time to go look at those more carefully, do careful reviews, and get this work done and out the door. Um, Softwire, likewise, they have a number of work items they've been working on. Dual Stack Lite is obviously progressing, and it's something that there's a lot of interest in. Um, if you go to Six Man, they are doing a number of items. I think most of those are relatively minor and not that interesting. I mean, yes, they need to be done. It's sort of, you know, you know, uh, dotting the I's, you know, and crossing the T sort of thing. Um, probably the most interesting one is the the RA, the router advertisement option for DNS. There's an experimental RFC that that did this already. It's being put on the standards track to give it more wider visibility and more of a green light to, to implement. And as a part of doing that, they've also now added the DNS search path to that document. So that you can, through an RA, get all the information you need to, you know, contact the DNS server and do work. Um, a, a more major item that's still out there is address selection, RFC 3484. And there's been a fair amount of discussion today and yesterday about problems with, you know, actually using V6 and having a long timeout. A lot of that is tied intimately with address selection. If you pick the right address, everything works beautifully. The trouble is, it's very hard to pick the right address in all situations. 
And so there's clearly a revision needed for the for 3484 just to clean up some loose ends that we know about in the sense that this is a relatively old RFC. Uh, we've deprecated site local addresses. There's ULAs in the meantime. And there's some tweaking we should be do just to bring it up to speed with the current documents that are out there and in a way that is not um, breaking the current implementations that are already out there. A, a longer term work item um, is, well, do we actually make, need to make some fairly substantial changes to address selection because what we're doing is simply not workable? And, and sort of one example I'll give there is what Apple has done is they aren't really doing 3484. They've done it completely differently and they send out parallel queries. Okay, you know, is that something that's really needed to be done? And if so, um, are, you know, how are we going to go about getting that done? Um, and I'll just also observe that there's no, you know, my take on the 3484 work is um, when we did it, you know, we understood that address selection is a hard problem. And fundamentally, um, the problem is, is that you need a lot of information in one place so you can sort of make an optimal decision. And that information is not in one place. It's scattered around the system. We have no way of getting into one place. And then furthermore, if you look at where the decisions are made, they're not made in a centralized place you know, by the application. They're spread out in different pieces of the APIs, and it's hard to bring them all together because they're in different components of the system. So I'm relatively skeptical that we're going to find sort of a magic bullet that's going to fix these problems we're seeing here with address selection. But that said, we have to make it better than what it is already. DHCP, uh, one of the things that's been missing for a long time is there is no way to bootstrap or you know, do network boot over DHCP v6 because the options were never defined. We have Pixie and v4 that's heavily used, um, but that work is now mostly done. It's gone through the ISG and is, there's a, you know, another revision needed to, to get, take care of the discusses and comments. Um, there's been some discussion about the multiple interfaces working group. This again is sort of tied to multi-homing and what happens if you have multiple addresses and there's different places you can go out and different routers you can use and you use the wrong one and it might be black hole or suboptimal and so forth. Um, there's a working group that's chartered to document the, the issues and also to sort of evaluate what are the current practices that are done and, and, and how helpful they are. They aren't chartered to develop any new solutions yet. Um, again, that's a, I think an important area to look at if you're concerned about this. this my own view is that this, again, is a very hard problem, and it's not clear that there's going to, well, it's clear to me there's not going to be an easy, straightforward solution that works the way we'd like to in an ideal world. And the question is, is what can we practically do, if anything, here to make the situation better than it already is? Um, and then finally, some loose ends, and these are sort of individual things. And um, there's a, one of the questions that keeps popping up again is, are slash 127s legal for point-to-point -point links? And, you know, there's some people that say yes, the specs say they are. Those people say, well, no, or it's not clear. And so obviously we either need to clarify this or agree that it isn't an issue that needs to be, to be fixed up. Um, the HCP default router option, that's a, a document that Ralph Drums and I um, put out for, you know, over a year ago. And at the time we, we, we brought it up, there was some support for it, but there's also a lot of opposition for it. And we sort of dropped it for lack of interest and lack of consensus. And again, you know, this week I'm hearing we need to do that. There are still this need to have the same features in V6 that you have in V4 so that somebody who's already got an infrastructure built using this kind of an option, they can just do so without having to re-architect something, even if it isn't all that hard to do. Why do we want to impose barriers where they're not really needed? Um, another question that comes up is um, unique local addresses. Uh, there's a centralized version and there is a, a probabilistically unique version. The probabilistically unique one is out there. There's, you know, People can use those and there's continues to be questions and, and request for a centralized place to get one so that I can get one, I can be guaranteed it's mine forever, and nobody's going to be able to take it away from me and, and that sort of thing. Well, we've been around and around on that one. The ITF has discussed it and essentially tabled it for lack of consensus, but in the last few months it came up again on the air inside, you know, in the PPML where they wanted to have this pushed through again. So, you know, do we need to do this or not? Can we just sort of, um, you know, close this in, in, in some sense for good so, it won't keep, so that we don't keep having the same conversations over and over again. And that's it. Thanks. I just want to note that I think it's about two years ago that I went ballistic and said, you know, Nat PT got deprecated, da, 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 da. And it's taken the IETF two years to turn around and redo it correctly. And I think that's pretty good. I think it actually is. It's much better than we normally think of the ITF. It hasn't taken five years. It's not bad. We, we do better work when it's under the gun, when we're under the gun. <laughs> yeah. Um, so all in all, what the heck. Yari, little sunshine.
All right, so trying to approach this issue from a wireless or cellular perspective, what do we have to do to make IPv6 happen on cellular networks? You know, after all this discussions that we've had, you know, we've had plenty of workshops in the last year about this, and, you know, even more in the last 10 years, we have lots of technology. But still, not much, if any, commercial deployment. Why is that? What can we do about it? Um, and, and I have a series of answers, and, and the first one that it's, it's really there. It's just for you to turn it on. That's the only thing you need to do. And um, some justification for this answer. Um, the standards have been placed since um, 98, basically. The cellular networks uh, generally have su all supported this since 2005. You can buy phones with IPv6 support. Um, we in the, the, at Ericsson have been doing this since 2003. Um, you can do it too. Um, there are issues, many issues, but they are practical. They are not fundamental or standards related. Just get on solving them and please stop developing theories about you know, alternative designs or optimizations that you think you need or other things. Just delay deployment. It, it, you, know, you just need to go and do it and that's it. Um, well, uh, moving away from the sunshine, I guess, um, there are other answers. So um, there are obviously some enhancements that would still be useful. So we keep inventing new ways to use IPv6 or new ways to basically use our networks or, or the internet. Um, we add home routers and, and it's not just mobile phones anymore, it's, it's routers. We're replacing our DSL connections with 50 megabit wireless connections. Um, and suddenly you need something. You need NATs in v4 and you need prefix delegation in v6. Um, IPv6 only networking, you'll need NAT64. Um, or you gain some additional operational experience and you realize, oh, we didn't actually do all the standards yet that, that we should have done, like I think is the case with DNS discovery. Um, and there is ongoing efforts around this um, in IETF, 3GPP, and so forth. Um, we just had a few months ago a, me a joint meeting with the 3GPP and ITF that uh, basically concluded that the components are there or the technology is there. Uh, you can just switch it on. Um, some networks are already running it. Um, but there are a few things that we could add. Um, and one of them was, was this um, translation technology from, from Behave. And, uh, and the third answer that I wanted to give to this uh, question, what can we do or why, why is this like this? Um, there's there's um, multiple goals that one could have. So we, we tend, or end users tend to think of this IPv6 problem as just enable v6 for me. But there's actually multiple possible things that we can do with v6 in, in mobile networks. So the mobility or the mobile networks are nice in the sense that they they separate the user traffic from underlying core network by these mobility tunnels. And, and then there's also this APN concept that separates different types of traffic, like uh, operators' own services and, and the general purpose internet access. And um, all of these things mean that the IPv6 can, can actually be independently deployed on the underlying network that, you know, between the nodes that do all the signaling that, that you need to move or and allow the mobiles to move around. Um, the user's traffic to internet, you know, that is of course dependent on what is the servers on the internet doing. Are they on v6 or v4 or what? Um, and then operate its own services, voice, IMS, and so forth. And, um, and then finally, uh, the fourth answer, what do you really need to do? Um, I mean, I, I want to end in sort of positive note that most, if not all, big operators have very serious efforts underway. I mean, you've heard some of it during these two, two days. But they, they really are looking at this. They're doing their preparations. They are, they are deploying. And, and uh, some of it will be publicly visible soon. Um, so things are happening. And, and what these operators actually need to do, they need to have the right network planning goals and motives for the different cases that I talked about in the answer number three. We need to turn on, turn on V6 because much of this code, I mean, it's been tested and it runs. but when you actually run it in production, you'll end up seeing problems. So we need to mature the code base by turning it on and actually getting that experience. 
And the big stuff is actually not just transporting the packet, but it's turning on that billing system that enables that, that uh, roaming to work, um, having procedures for V6, having personnel trained, um, upstream connectivity, dealing with whitelists, you know, all, all kinds of practical things like that. That's where the effort is. That's where the, where, where the problems are. And of course, we don't have all devices today supporting V6, it's a small fraction. So that's another thing that, that needs to improve. Maybe, you know, maybe Frederick's efforts and, and, and Google can help there and you know, we can make at least Android to do uh, V6 on, on all devices in the future. And we need to do that for other um, products as well, but one by one, that's all I have. Thanks, Yari. Um, um, from an ISP's perspective, by the way, I'd note that the back end stuff and, and the billing systems, et cetera, et cetera, are the main thing. Um, um, we're pressed for, we have a half an hour left, um, so just be conscious of that, and they do have a clock stuck over there. Mazu. Yep. Oops, got to figure out how to get out of this. Thank you. Thank you. Five what? Oh. Okay, this is my for my AJ. So I'd like to share needs from Backbone. First, I'd like to know our own network. So we need measurement. And uh, people suggest to deploy dual stack network, but the traffic flow different between IPv4 and IPv6. So somehow we'd like to know the volume or statistics. So there are standards already. So I'd like to ask vendors to support these uh, MIP or net flows. And uh, another point, we need variable length support. So 128 or 127 or whatever. This actually works on existing routers. But vendors say, it's it's not guaranteed, but it works. And the uh, problem so far, a few routers, uh, actually, I had only one case that have restriction that they can't install these longer prefixes into its fib. So you can check on lib, but uh, the router can't forward in. Yeah, it's interesting. And uh, so far, from backbone, that's all. So it's working. We are ready to transmit IPv6. Good. I'll be honest. You've been moving IPv6 since when? 98? Like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ready for 12 years. Um, Ron. <laughs> Let's see if I can figure out how to do this here. You're probably better at it than I am, right? Oops, there's two of them. You can figure it out. Yeah. Get the right one here. Is that the PowerPoint? Yeah. I don't know. You want to borrow my glasses? <laughs> no, that is PowerPoint, isn't it? Yeah, or the PowerPoint. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. For the beginning, we go to. What was the trick? No, don't believe that Control L stuff. That's for PDFs. Yeah, yeah. yeah There's yeah. some little icon right here Swoop. that you click and it makes it show. Oh, yeah. I was just doing this one too. There we go. Okay. 
On a portable? Oh, I can use this one, I think. Okay, so I'm going to cover the uh, IP in the IPv6 in the enterprise, what's still needed. Um, and this is just kind of based on my experience and my environments and so forth. Your environment may be a little different. But um, a lot of it falls into these general categories, which I covered in my talk yesterday. Uh, the big one being feature parity um, in all the mainstream vendor products. Uh, V6 needs to just be as good as V4 so that it doesn't feel like we're going backwards or that you keep running into uh, just places where in your infrastructure you think you're fully uh, V6 capable and then there's just some feature that's missing that you, you think should just should have been there and it's because the vendor hasn't gotten around to implementing it yet. And it's not only the, the functionality, but it's the performance. We need it in hardware at line rate, just like in V4. So, you know, think ASICs and that's why it takes, you know, new new product versions, hardware versions um, to uh, to get that performance often. Um, also, we, we've noticed a lot of problems in just the vendor QA of products. And this is because uh, vendors not eating their own dog food. They don't live on their own stuff. And we found, too, that you know, when we, some of the bugs we've seen is just it's very basic. It's like, haven't you tested this in your environment at all? And it's because the QA uh, suites are not uh, mature. And I think if the vendors had to live on their own stuff and feel the pain, uh, stuff would get fixed a lot quicker. So those are just kind of general things across the board with get out getting into a bunch of specifics. Um, some other pieces. Um, I'd like to be able to do DHCPv6. It's what I wanted to do, you know, just eight, ten years ago almost, but it requi requires broad client support, which is just not there. I mean, in our environment, mostly we have Windows XP, uh, Mac OS X, neither of those have DHCPv6 clients. And so that was sort of a non-starter and remains that way. Um, because of all the uh, Windows machines that uh, once in a while get uh, ICS turned on and various other things that cause rogue RA announcements, um, we need something like RA Guard, and I know it's, there's an internet draft for that. We want to see that implemented in the Switch products. That's fairly high priority for us, and for now we have to come up with workarounds, and operationally that's, that's an impact. Uh, we really need the unified IP MIB implemented across product lines. That's the uh, RFC uh, 4293. I think Moz um, mentioned it as well. Um, it's... It's implemented, it's kind of spotty. I mean, it's Cisco, it's sort of in some versions, but it's it's a huge challenge to figure out what products it's implemented in. Um, Juniper, you know, some products it's implemented, you know, uh, for example, the NetScreen products, just, just not even there at all. And so there's no way to do some of the network management that you need um, with, a, with a common MIB that works both for V4 and V6. Also, for things like uh, all the, the flow protocols we need, the flow information include both V4 and V6. Uh, for management reasons as well. Um, IPv6 on public-facing services. We found that this has just been a problem, not only for us, but a lot of the other enterprises we deal with. And it, it's there's a number of showstoppers there. Uh, one of them, a big one, is Akamai. As everybody who's behind Akamai, there's just no way to get v6 support, and that's the initial showstopper. Or the colo or hosting facility they're on, the, the, their network just doesn't support v6. Or the load balancers don't support v6 or the network engineers that really want to do V6 have no influence on the local IT or marketing staff that runs the web server. Uh, this, this we run into over and over again. Um, and they won't consider uh, simple alternatives to get started, like a simple V6, V4 proxy, just to even front end it, just to get going. Um, so usually for a lot of companies, it just stops right there. Um, OS vendors. Um, for Microsoft, I, I, if I had enough money and I uh, was king for a day, I'd just outlaw XP because, um, and get everybody on Windows 7 uh, because of um, IPv6 not on by default, so you have to convince somebody to turn it on. There's no DHCPv6, there's no DNS over IPv6, easy to become a rogue router with ICS turned on. And so we'd love to see the world get, get up to a later version. Um, if I, I, what I'd really love is to find a way to turn off the privacy randomized address centrally. Um, some people are saying we'll just do it Active Directory, but in my environment, you know, I got thousands of customers that are all independent, autonomous, not part of AD. And so I need a bit or a knob somewhere in the network, like you know, like we have the M and O bits and other bits in the router advertisements. I'd like another bit that just says, please don't do privacy or randomized addresses, because in an enterprise, there's many, many reasons why that's a killer. And um, so I need to have that turned off without visiting every machine. Uh, for Apple, uh, Mac OS X has just been getting worse over the years, and especially with 10.6 and the MDNS, respond, the MDNS responder brokenness, um, also the 6 to 4 preferences we've been hearing about. 
We really need to get Apple to fix those bugs. We need to get DHCPv6 support. I'd love to have Isotap support for some of our transition scenarios that would really, really help. Um, I think Apple internally would be good if they dual stack their own network, ate their own dog food, had their people living on it, and then and then whitelist them and so that they feel the pain. Um, also, I'm sure hoping that V6 works well in iOS 4 as promised, and we shall see. Um, there's the, the just do it, which I, I think that really in order to get it into an enterprise, you need a corporate culture. It's got to permeate the entire IT culture in an organization. You can't just have the engineering staff make progress. You need to get buy-in from the CIO and the CEO on down. You need a local champion or an evangelist. And in every IT initiative in the organization, it has to have an IPv6 story, um, and especially when you're doing tech refresh. This doesn't have to be expensive. It takes time if you're doing it with tech refresh, but every time you're buying something new or doing an upgrade, make sure it's done the V6 way. Uh, for training, we got to simplify it. We can't send people to these many multiple day classes because by the time they come home and actually get around to it a month later, it, it seems overwhelming. They would have forgotten everything. They don't know where to start. It's better just to give some simple, easy steps. And for a lot of people, um, I think we can tell them what are some of the easy steps like, you know, do a triage, do the simple things first, the low-hanging fruit, and so do things like worry about addressing, then your connectivity via the ISP, then do a test bit, then do some training, then enable your public-facing services, then worry about your security perimeter, and then your internal networks, then your systems and apps, and, and sort of build out from there, um, and that certainly works a lot better. So that's the enterprise story. Thanks, Ron. I'd like to just make one comment, which is um, when uh, all these nice folks from vendors stand up here and blow smoke up my skirt, is that when you say that you want line rate and ASICs, when the vendors, yeah, I see you, Mark, talk about backbone, et cetera, et cetera, they think, oh, there's 2% on the backbone. Nobody's going to really notice that this thing won't go full bore for five years. When you deploy in enterprise and you deploy V6, your LAN starts screaming V6 and the thing better run line rate. Lorenzo. Okay. You're going to play it on your own? Yeah, I mean. You know what you're doing. I've, I've been talking too much anyway. Um, I think I, I met somebody and, and she said, um, so I didn't know who you were because you never introduced yourself, and you, but you talk all the time. So obviously everyone <laughs> knew you. Um, so just briefly, the um, thing is, at least for us, I mean, we and the content provider has, you know, it, it, they do they do a lot, right? They we run at least you know here we run we run a, a network, you know, that looks like a backward network. At least some of it does. So we need hardware forwarding. We need NetFlow. We need um, we need filtering on extensions headers, that, thank you very much. They're not just the first one, because otherwise, if something comes in with, with a routing header, our only recourse is to drop it. So hardware support there and, 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 and feature parity. Then, you know, load balancers, yes, load balancers with, with first of all, load balancers with, with IPv6 support, you know, just, just to get started. And then it, it would be nice if you could use v6 to talk to your backends as well. So if you don't want to terminate SSL on your, on your front end load balancers, then um, you can do that too. Um, so, and then how's the load balancer going to talk to the network? Well, I mean, do you have VR, do we have VRP? Well, maybe we don't have that yet, or maybe we can't do it with global addresses. So VRP, but this is, this is what we've been saying for, for, for a day and a half now, which is feature parity, because uh, unless you have feature parity, you don't know which feature you're going to need tomorrow. And the only way to, to know that your design, what you design tomorrow is going to work with the gear you have is if the gear you have supports everything at the same level. And I, I understand that it might be difficult, but really that's the only way out of this. Um, so, um, and finally, and, 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 and this is, you know, to some extent, can be worked around in, in this is our own engineering. Um, and something that we really can't work around by ourselves is, is brokenness out there in the field. Um, um, so uh, broken CPs out there, they'll never be replaced, and, and, and there's nothing we can do about that, right? Because they're in home networks, and the ISP doesn't own them, and, and we don't own them, 
and the user owns them and the user doesn't know what the problem is. So we need it. We need to fix that. And I think the OS manufacturers need to need to help there. Uh, although um, we haven't really had a lot of success there yet. So basically, um, give us feature parity and networking. Um, if you do MD5 passwords, do them for V6 as well. Don't just implement them in one place and then, oh, yeah. Or if when you fix bugs, oh, this is race condition. We fixed it for V4, but we didn't think it mattered for V6, and so on. So it, it boils down to two things, the feature parity and networking hardware, and let's find a way to fix those broken users. So that's it for me. Well, Master, do we have time for questions? Yeah, 15. Woo. OK, we have time, room for 15 questions. <laughs> <laughs> or some answers. Cameron Byrne, T-Mobile. Can we get to a flag day? Can we revisit it and not think it's laughable? At least, at least. By a flag day, you mean um, what happened at an analog and what happened at a couple not things? Not turn off IPv4. We're not going to turn it off. That's not realistic. But can we get to a flag day where we earnestly turn IPv6 on? <laughs> Don't want to have an answer to that. I don't. <laughs> well, Moz has an answer for it. We did it in 98. Next. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember in uh, January 1, 1983, when we turned off NCP, worked great. There were stragglers, things broke, but it got fixed really fast. That's why I think, you know, don't be afraid to break some glass is kind of my motto. At some point, you really have to make that decision. Um, I think, um, I mean, for me, in my mind, you know, the day that Google feels safe enough to really just not have to do whitelist anymore instead of do blacklist, that's kind of a flag day in, in one sense. What would we have to do to fix all the, the backbones, the transport, the, the brokenness out in the operating systems and in all the home networks and so forth to where the brokenness is small enough or at least equivalent to V4 that we could, you know, Google or others could feel safe to do that. That would, in a, in a way, be a flag day. I think that if, if we fix the OSs, and, and so one of the problems with the flag day is that when do you call the day, right? Do you want to wait for Yahoo to, 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 to have their stuff done? And their roadmap was, was here yesterday, and it's, it's next year, right? So do you want to wait a year? Do you want to start, or do you want to start now gradually? And as, as, as regards Google, right, if, if, if we can get working packets to users, that's the main thing that's missing, right? It's not that we have issues on our side. Matthew from Internode. Um, I agree with Cameron. I think uh, we should stop fearing fear itself and actually get on with it um, because if we don't we're going to continue to sit in fear of turning it on and that that appears to be the problem at the moment we are deadlocked with fear there is a tiny percentage of people who may not work and we kind of need to do it because if we don't start to move forward now um, we're going to be just as much of a problem as running out of IPv4 Can I say something? Hi. Um, Ron, you almost said it. I, I, I walked up here to say, why don't we put, if we're going to talk about a flag day, um, define what earnest means. And I think it's, it's, it's a quad A flag day. That's what we're really talking about, right? So the day that all the content providers say, OK, there you go. And it's advertised, and you know, you know that there might be brokenness out there. Everybody's waiting. Everybody, the service providers are expecting problems. It's even in the press. Whatever. The quad A flag day. Decide amongst yourselves when that is. Uh, how about the um, SMTP received header flag day? That when I get email from inside a vendor, I look and I see if the actual vendor's desktop machine came from an IPv6 address so that I know you were eating your own dog food and maybe your products would work. Well, 
Um, um, Time and time again, we heard the vendors aren't eating the dog food. (laughs) And, And that means that, you know, the consequences are pretty obvious. And, and you, Lorenzo, are trying to get Google internally. You hit a speed bump, and you're coming back off it. But, you know, and, and we're doing it inside. Um, um, when I first moved to Tokyo, I found out part of IIJ had slipped back from V6, and Maz and I had to push. Okay? Get it rolled out internally. So you're eating your own dog food, whether you're an ISP, whether you're a vendor, whether you're a content provider, or whether you're Dino. All I can say is we lead by example. You know, I can't, um, um, don't buy from a vendor whose email headers aren't V6. Well, but but, but <laughs> then, then, then you might say don't buy a vendor who's, who's not in the V6 routing table, and that's our, that's our network wiped out. So, I mean, you have to go somewhere. Do you have to say, I will buy this many, uh, buy this amount of equipment, and that gets the VPs to listen? It really does. That's the lever you have. Now, I feel uncomfortable about saying that because I don't want to be this greedy prostitute, but that's the real world. We've known you for many years. You are a greedy prostitute. The, the, <laughs> the point is, don't buy the kit unless they're for real. It's not just go to the VPs and say, I will buy ten more billion dollars worth of your rubbish if it moves V6. It's I will not Randy, buy. Ne- negative doesn't work. You have to be positive. It's not fear that the the vendors care about. It's greed. When I greed when I stopped orders, John Chambers moved. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to say that wouldn't have worked for us. That that would have been a non-starter. Yes, we we spent I, 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 it, it, approximately zero on hardware. We we got in early, so that maybe that's why it worked for us. But that wouldn't have worked for us. I mean, saying saying to middle, hey, here's this big carrot. No. I mean, we, there's internal buy-in as well, right? You, you don't you're not 100 percent committed, and you just have to beat your vendors into submission. That's not the way it works. Because everyone is saying, well, I don't want to take a step, so I'm waiting for someone. No, Lorenzo's still talking. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to talk while Lorenzo's talking. Ralph. Okay. Ralph Wallace, command control. Um, Quick, just a quick question. How many solution providers are in here? A solution provider is somebody who goes out to help people transition to IPv6. They provide a service to people to help them transition to IPv6. Who else is in here? John, you're, but you're kind of, I understand, John. <laughs> Wait a second, so I'm, who else? What, what and who, uh, you, okay, so there's two, there's, in this entire place, you've got two, my, our company, and this company over here, you've got people here who are, water, who are listening in so that we can go to Enterprises, public or private, and help them transition to IPv6. And so I'm hearing you guys talk back and forth, you know, flag day, things like that. I know by NCP, right? So we go to places trying to help people transition to IPv6 and give them the reason for that. And I'm hearing you guys argue, 
right? And so here I am trying to help people see the transition IPv6. And I just want to make sure that you guys got a perspective from us because we went out and we trained DARPA. Remember the ARPANET? We trained DARPA on implementing IPv6 to their IT staff and how to secure IPv6 based on all the RFCs, right? They're a Cisco and a Microsoft shop. Their choice, not ours, right? When we don't want to train their IT staff, we train them for two weeks, and they came off the training, and they went, holy crap, how come somebody hadn't told us this before? This is the IT enterprise infrastructure staff for DARPA. My point, here we are here talking about certain things. You know what? There's a lot more education that we need to do out there, folks. So if that's a wake-up call, I hope it is. I think we forgot the training. Scott, did we do any trainees there? No. I, I, yeah, I think we forgot the training part. Not a question, but <laughs> no, internally, I mean, we, I, I don't, I can't remember us. Did we do it? We didn't do any training. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we sort of said, oh, we have this thing. Bob? And we didn't deliver, okay. <laughs> well, nicely put. Understand my point. Yeah, yeah. Training is part of the transition process. If you don't give them the wake-up call, if you don't have the people that are going to be transitioning, a common language of how to talk, what is a ULA? Right? Why is ICMPV6 important? Yeah, no, that's okay. You know, it, thinking about the Flag Day thing, it, what we ought to do as a community, think about where would we like to be a year from now? Um, and a date that's close to that is uh, June 6 of 2011, which is five years after the six bone was turned off. Um, you know, there's a, a good date that could be in people's mind if you want to start socializing. So what could be accomplished by then? Make it a media event. It'll be right after the IANA runs out. Of, um, I mean, there could be a lot of opportunities there. So there's the date, but what do you want to have done by then? I mean, I think we could be thinking about that. Um, set a line in the sand. Maybe we turn something off on that day, or maybe that's something where, you know, if you don't have some Lines feature... closed. Okay. We got yeah. three minutes left. Okay. I'll turn it over. You Bob. lose, Martin. <laughs> Bob. So uh, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, Bob Hinden. So for the company I work for, the thing that really got us motivated to put V6 in the product was, well, me, I would like to think it was me giving presentations, but what it really was was uh, the potential for losing sales or losing business, you know, or customers saying, "I will not. I'm going to switch to another vendor unless you do this." So that that worked quite well. And, um, um, but in your case, it was a check mark, and in many of the vendors' cases, it's weak implementation. Not they've got the check mark. Yeah. Well, we we had have some customers who have real plans that are going to need this. Oh, I understand. John. So we've uh, we've done what uh, Dino suggested. That 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 actually works. You know, I've I've personally withheld payment on things until it worked. I've also taken we've also taken our business elsewhere. Not me personally, but somebody else in the company took uh, load balance of business elsewhere. That also works. Um, you know I also think that some, you know, we, you know, to somebody's point, you know, we talk a lot. I think actually doing it actually helps. And for whatever it's worth, I mean, we're we're ready when you are, right? Dude, where's my cable modem? It's in my hotel. <laughs> <laughs> talk is cheap. Talk it's is cheap. It's in my hotel room. <laughs> it's still there. I, well, it's in my new hotel room at the Westin in St. Francis. So talk is cheap. So so I mean, yeah, and, and and I'm I'm not I'm not being cheap. I don't think. Um, so I mean, like I said, I'm ready when you are, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I welcome quad A's, right? Uh, we know that there's problems out there. We all do, right? Um, and and part of what we, we, you know, we've been thinking this is, you know, and, and we've heard this here is, you know, sometimes you gotta, somebody keeps saying you gotta break a little, you gotta break some eggs or whatever. I, I think uh, there's something to that. Okay, just end on a positive note. How, how many people here think things are better in Japan? Good, we solved that one. Pardon? 
The food is much better. <laughs> My wife says that's why we live there. Yep. Okay, good. That education got done finally. It took a while. Um, that's about it. Eric, do you want to wrap? Thank you, guys. I got it. Thank you. So this is very interesting and different conference from last year. Uh, some things have been definitely uh, changing. There's definitely seems to be more of a uh, awareness is, is clearly shifting, right? There's focus is shifting, and and especially as deployment comes to, comes to fruition, there's issues about education. And previous talks about education was about you know awareness education, and now it's about operational education, and that's definitely different. Um, more focusing on, on real uh, details, like last mile issues and some new apps kind of stuff. Uh, there are several people to thank. I'd like to thank the external folks who helped us plan, helped us choose talks and get things together and provide contacts and all that kind of stuff. That's Randy, John Brzezowski, Mark Townsley, and others, and uh, Ed Maz. And uh, I have to thank our event staff, Lissandra, who's not here today, and Sabrina, who is uh, coordinating your T-shirts, um, which are outside in the lobby. I have to thank all of the, all the speakers, everyone who came with, with lightning talks and, and presented and, and uh, so on and so forth, and, and panel participants. This talk isn't anything without you guys, so thank you so much, and thank you all for coming. One of the things that I never thought about uh, starting V6 because I thought it was just kind of cool technology, but turns out there's a lot of cool people that you meet doing that too. So that's uh, that's been fantastic. Thank you all for coming. Um,